What an honor it is to be here with you tonight. Feel the great presence of the Lord that I have already felt, felt and sensed. And uh, how many just glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. I, I, I get excited about being in the presence of the Lord. And anything is possible when we get in his presence. And so uh, we are so thrilled and delighted to be here. It's an honor to be in this great city, in this uh, great section. Uh, I give honor to your district superintendent, of course, pastor here, Brother Stoops. It's great to be with him. And, and all the great ministry and those that have made the trek to be here today. Thank God it's not snowing. And uh, I, uh, uh, this whole thing, snow and so forth. I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, but then, of course, spent 18 years in the state of Florida. And uh, God has a great sense of humor. Someone said, why in the world would you leave Florida to go to St. Louis, misery? I mean, Missouri, I'm, I'm working on that. And uh, I said, you either have to be in the will of God or absolutely out of your mind. And so I, I prefer being in the will of God. And so uh, it is a thrill to be here tonight with you. And uh, I've, I can leave and say I've been in snow and I've been in 60 degree, almost 60 degree weather and it's the same week here in Maine. And so uh, having a wonderful time. But I do want to say thank you for your giving to Christmas for Christ because you have made a difference in missionaries all across North America. Uh, there is a great need in North America tonight. North America is in dire need of an apostolic revival of unprecedented proportion. Uh, in fact, I was with a friend of mine, Monty Showalter, great, outstanding global missionary. He was in our home just a few uh, weeks ago, and Brother Showalter and I began to talk about the great needs in North America. And he said, you know, he said, what I found out in researching just last year, he said, I found out that uh, when the merger took place of the United Pentecostal Church, the approximately 20% of our constituents lied outside of North America. 80% of the constituents of the United Pentecostal Church were within the borders of North America. And we set out to reach the world. In fact, we created a motto that simply said the whole gospel to the whole world. And I am thankful for that. And I am thankful for the passion and the burden. In fact, when I left Orlando, we were supporting 62 missionaries monthly globally around the world. And I thank God for that and for what we have done globally. But tonight, I am here tonight to tell you, Brother Show Walter said, you know what, I did some research last year and he said, I found out that now 81% of the constituency of the United Pentecostal Church now lies outside of North America. Only 18% or 19% of the United Pentecostal Church is within the borders of North America. We have got work to do lest we become like the England of old that in uh, great times sent missionaries all over the world. But tonight they lay spiritually dormant and dead and truly one of the most spiritually uh, anemic uh, nations in the world. I believe we can reach North America with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. We need to reach North America with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, I can take you to cities tonight. Thank God we have missionaries that are now on their way just in the, in the situations and, and, and options of the last few weeks. But, but tonight we still have a city in North America that is larger than 69 countries of the world and it yet has no apostolic voice in it tonight. A city of over 750,000 people, Quebec City. I'm thankful there's a missionary that's gathering support and is going to be on their way shortly for that city. But it's, it's a sad day when we have cities that large that do not have apostolic churches within our borders. We have cities, and I just a few months ago I had my family in Vancouver, British Columbia, and showed them an area where there is 300,000 people in an area and there has never been an apostolic church in that area. Tonight, if we were to look at the Dallas-Fort Worth area, the population is over six and a half million people in just that one metroplex. But can I tell you, in order to reach just one percent of that population tonight, we would need 6,500 churches just in that area with a hundred people in each of those churches just to be reaching one percent of the population there. We do have work to do and I'm glad we're not here to do it alone because when we unite together 
together and we do truly become what God has called us to be one, one with one another I believe we can through unity and the power of the Holy Ghost we can reach North America together and so I encourage you this year give your greatest gift to Jesus Christ would you help us assist missionaries in North America the need is great and staggering in fact just two years ago three years ago now I believe the offering for North American missions was a little over two and a half million dollars reached and yet the truth was that particular year out of the applications that we received we would have needed an additional two million dollars just to meet the current request that year so the gap was great and in fact if you looked at the statistic you'd find that only less than 25% of the missionaries in North America were even applying for funds because the lack of funds were, uh, of, of availability but I'm happy to report in the last two years the, the offering has increased exponentially in fact uh, we have had a nearly a half a million dollar increase and I am so thankful and that has sustained itself for the last two years to where last year we set an all time record of over three million dollars given to missionary we're closing the gap thank you for helping us do that we're here to serve you in any way shape that we can and we want to be a blessing we have very easy ways that you can receive offerings to the pastors please talk to me afterwards about Christmas for Christ and I want to help you and assist you with these offerings tonight because I believe Christmas is a great time to receive an offering because the truth is, uh, you know, somebody said, well, you know, I don't know about an offering Christmas time. People have so many other expenses. Tell that to the Salvation Army who raises 98% or 95 to 98% of their total annual income from November 1 to December 31st. They locked into something. People are willing to give. I'd rather them give to something that will be eternally important. I'd rather them give to assist missionaries in North America. And so so would you help us this year? Would you make a difference for Christmas for Christ in some missionary's life and truly make a difference for them? If you will, would you say amen? Amen. And so I want to say thank you. And I know some of you are saying, is the commercial just about over? Was he going to preach? But uh, just to let you know a little bit about things that are happening in North America, I wanted to give you that little bit of update, but also tell you thank you for the difference that you are making in North American missionaries' lives. And so uh, I, I'd ask you tonight, if you have your Bibles, let's get right to the word of the Lord tonight. How many, how many believe the Lord can do something on a Thursday night? You know, it's easy to kind of check in and say, oh, that's just kind of a promo service and we're going to kind of bide our time and go on. But I, I feel like the Lord is willing and able to do something miraculous. And, and uh, uh, years ago, my pastor taught me, Paul Mooney said this, he said, don't ever waste a service. And I, I've, I've lived my ministry by that. Let's not waste a service uh, tonight. Let's see what the Lord will do for us in this service tonight. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Exodus. We're going to look at Exodus chapter number 14 tonight and uh, uh, look at somebody and say you look good tonight I turn to somebody else and say you know if you look as good as I do you you really do look good tonight amen well 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 Exodus chapter number 14 tonight and I am like that lightning bug that backed into the fan. I'm delighted to be with you. And, uh, ooh, I knew that was going to happen. You know, let, let me just do that. That way they're both there. Amen. Oh, that's okay. Because I'll knock it over later anyway. So now it's already settled. When I need it, I know where they're at. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, amen. Exodus chapter number 14. Let's look at verse number 4. Or 1 and 2. Uh, let's do that. And, and it says this. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pyroth, between Migdal. Anybody know where that's at? He said, And the sea, over against Baiai's fawn, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. 
Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your word tonight. I, I, I thank you for your power and your rich mercy. I ask God tonight that you would speak to our hearts. Uh, touch our lives tonight like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated here tonight. As for read the story, no doubt, and in the book of Psalm 77, he describes his anguish, and then he looks to what God did in that moment. In Psalm 77, 19 and 20, it says, Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps, the footsteps are not known. Thou leadest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Just think about the miraculous of what happened. The wind blew, the earth split. The waters became towering walls and the Israelites passed through on that dry shod that day. Not really for entertaining purposes but simply to prove to them and everyone else, uh, anybody that was watching to prove God that he simply will make a way where there is no way. Uh, for you see God is able to make a way where there is no way or, of escape. Uh, God is able to look into the circumstance uh, and do the miraculous and impossible in any circumstance. God is able to make a way where there is no way. The book of Isaiah 43, 19, Behold, he said, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye know it. I even will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Colossians said, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving wherewithal also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance. One translation says that God will make a way. God will make a way. Isaiah said, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river and shall smite it in the seven trees and make men go over dry shod. Can I tell you tonight that God will always make a way for his tried and his trusted children. Even if God has to split an ocean to do so, he is is capable of making a way where there is no way. Have you ever been set up? You just, you just got set up, if you will. And I, tonight I'm going to preach to you for a little while on simply when God sets you up. Some of you are looking at me like I lost it all. No, I haven't lost it all, just part of it. And yet, you know, I, and I mean, some of you are looking at me, well, you know, set up and we don't really want to admit it. But, you know, it's, you know, when you go to the, uh, uh, get your oil changed and the guy comes out and says, you need a new air filter. I'm totally convinced they have a bad air filter for every car back there. They pick the dirtiest of them all. And they're going to show you that one, you know. And I'm just never sure because I, I always think, you know, I, I think I just got an air filter the last time I was here. Or do you, need, you, need, you do need new windshield wipers. Well, they were fine on my way here tonight. But, oh no, you probably need those windshield wipers. You know, you got to be safe, you know. And, you know, and or, or, or my favorite, you know, you go to McDonald's drive through and they always say, would you like to have an apple pie with that? And you don't even like apple pie, but you say, sure. And you're driving down the road and you're thinking, what did I get an apple pie for? Well, it was two for a dollar, that's why. And you walk away, thinking, yeah, and somebody said, not anymore, you know, you know. And, but yet, the truth is, you, you just got set up, if you will. And, and we don't like as humans to be set up. I, I don't like to be set up in those circumstances and situations. I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like it whenever I just walk away saying, you know, that was just kind of a setup. Whether you're in a meeting and somebody just kind of throws the ball up in the air and next thing you know you bid on it and the next thing you know you've just been set up to the circumstance. But, but can I talk to you a little while tonight about simply when God sets us up. 
Now understand, it's not about setting us up like a mankind would do where it's not necessarily for our good or, or the betterment of ourselves, but it's a, a setup, if you will, that mankind does. But no, we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about the fact that when God sets you up, the only way when God sets you up, it is always for your good. It is always for your betterment. It's always to make a way. It's always to give you an understanding of his ability and power. It's always to give you a revelation about how glorious and magnificent God is. For sometimes God walks into our lives and God sets us up. He brings us to a place where maybe we don't understand. He puts us into a circumstance that we can't really comprehend why we are there. But it's just like Reba Robinson that lay awake at night, night after night in Starksville, Mississippi. She was clutching that old shirt of her son's. For she knew her son was confronting death in some far off place. For you see, Dylan, her son, was a Marine. He was assigned to spec ops. Dylan, he was in dangerous circumstances and situations. And it was those motherly instincts that told her when he was in harm's way. For she was praying the night he swam ten miles from a sub to some far off coast of a hostile country. She was praying the night when he parachuted behind enemy lines from a high altitude jump. It was Reba's prayers that night when he jumped from a chopper through the hail of enemy fire. His eyes blinded by tears to retrieve a body of a fallen friend. Reba was praying the night that Dylan was attacked by a terrorist that stuck a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. But it was perhaps her prayers that caused that gun to jam and gave Dylan that split second opportunity to resolve the problem and escape. She was praying that night uh, through nocturnal tears and terror and torment uh, of all kinds of circumstances. Uh, She continued to pray when finally he came home, uh, but continued to pray as he transitioned uh, from that hero to citizen, uh, trying not to remember what he could not forget. Uh, But can I tell you tonight, uh, there are some in this place just like Dylan's mom. Uh, You're facing circumstances and struggle. Uh, You're facing pressure and pain uh, that you don't understand. Uh, You're afraid, facing impossible odds, walking down dark valleys you don't understand. Can I tell you that there's some things that are simply just beyond our control and our abilities. It can be that ring of the telephone in the middle of the night. It can be the card in the mail or the knock at the door that sends us over the edge. We fall into that world of worry and heartache. We fall into that world of concern and how am I going to get out of this again? One man said worry is putting a question mark where God has already put a period. Another man said worry really is a form of atheism for it betrays a lack of faith and trust in God. Can I tell you, it is no accident I believe that the Bible refers to us as sheep, but I know that sheep's tendency, it will bolt in the middle of a millisecond. Sheep can bolt, they can be concerned, they can scatter so quickly. In a moment's fear, everything is lost in their minds that God wants us to understand and as was mentioned in the psalmist you've got to get a revelation though I walk yea though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for thou art with me thy rod thy staff they comfort me I prepare the table before me in the presence of my name my cup runs surely goodness and mercy shall follow me oh I got a revelation it's going to be okay it's going to be all right Some of you say, how can I not worry when my finances are a wreck? How can I not worry when my loved one has a terminal illness? How can I not worry when my job has been terminated or my child's in trouble? Yet how can you not worry when the Red Sea is in front of you and the mountains of both sides of you and the soldiers of Egypt are behind you? That sounds like a pretty good place to worry. 
But you see, Reba, she prayed at a critical time in Dylan's life. A friend invited him to a revival service. He went grudgingly, planning on leaving quickly. But the message, it hit home that night. And he gripped the back of the pew as if he said, I gripped it like I was trying to choke it. He said, I faced death without shaking. But tonight, he said, I was trembling like a leaf. He staggered to that altar and he laid his burdens down there at that great altar, understanding that God can make a way where there is no way. God can bring transformation where it seems like there is no hope for it. In that story of the Red Sea, the Israelites followed that pillar of cloud and that fire carefully, full of the excitement, of the anticipation. We're free. I can just see the high fives and the excitement all around. We're finally free. We've got a hope of a promised land. We've got a great opportunity before us. Moses, did you see how God gave us hope? Did you see what God did to Pharaoh? Did you see the great miraculous provision I never dreamed it could happen I never dreamed I could be free only to find out that full of excitement about their future that they were following God and God was leading them to a cul-de-sac I said God was leading them to a cul-de-sac a place of a setup you say, oh, would God do that? Well, you see, there were some problems with Israel. And number one was that they felt they had been enslaved for all these years, and they had in some ways. But you see, uh, uh, you know, in order to be a slave, you, and really that generation couldn't say they were slaves, because if you were a slave, you can't get paid. And this generation had been paid. And you say, well, how did they get paid? Well, I'll tell you how they got paid. Well, the Bible said when it came time for Egypt, or them to leave Egypt, God told Moses, he said, go tell my people to go borrow everything you can. I mean, think about that. I'm leaving tonight. Anybody want to loan me a hundred bucks? I mean, come on. Come on. I mean, you got a nice suit. You don't need it. She doesn't even know you have it in your tuck wallet area, you know? Oh, okay. Come on, just a hundred bucks, you know? I mean, you know, that's kind of a nice watch. Can I borrow that watch, you know? Is that one of them Apple watches that nobody else has, you know? No, no, it's not. Well, I don't really want that one then. Anyway, no, I'm kidding. And you, can you imagine how they just kind of stuck it in their pocket, this, that, and the other, and next thing you know, they're, they're just, some of you said, well, are you sure that happened like that? Well, you know, I just can't help. I would just love to have had a, 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 the ability to, to, to kind of watch what took place that day. Because, you know, I just have a feeling the next morning, Pharaoh gets up, he's ready for a drink, and he calls his servant, hey, servant, come here. Nobody shows up. Where are they? He looks at the soldier. Uh, soldier says, well, you, you, uh, uh, you, you let them go yesterday. Oh, well, then you go get me something to drink. He just realizes he got demoted. So he goes and he's gone a little more, uh, a little longer than really anticipated. And uh, he comes kind of, cowering down a little bit, you know, and where's my drink, soldier? Uh, well, there's a problem with that. What? What's the problem? Well, we can't find your gold cup. Well, get my silver one then. I, where's my gold cup? Well, there's a problem with that. And, of course, he goes out and he comes back a little... He said, well, you know, there's a little problem with that little gold cup. And in fact, there's even a greater problem with your silver cup, too. He said, where's my gold cup? Where's my silver? Well, you know, you know those guys you let go yesterday? Yeah. Well, we loaned it to them. Well, fix me something to eat. Well, we would, but we don't have anything to 
fix it with. Why? Well, you know those pots and pans that have been carried down all those generations? Yeah. Well, that's, you know, the ones you used to have? I used to have? Well, at least get me a steak. Well, we would, but the cow went too. You say, are you sure that happened? Oh, I believe, I believe maybe not exactly like that happened, but I think it was probably a story that was played out over and over in the hearts of the Egyptians because as they began to look around, they find out that, you know, everything. You, you say, are, are you sure that Israel walked out with all that stuff? Oh, absolutely sure. I know for a fact they walked out with the wealth of Egypt. <laughs> Every little hour that they were spent working, building the wealth of Egypt, God said, you know what, I'm paying you back for every hour that you worked. You're not going to be indebted. I'm not going to be indebted to you. I'm going to pay you back for every hour. And yet, the midst of it all, you see, you say, well, are you sure? Yes, I'm absolutely sure. Because if you read a little bit later in Exodus, the Bible said, God said, all right, enough's enough. I, I, it's time. I've got to dwell among you. I've got to be around you. It's time you build me a tabernacle so that I might dwell among you. How are we going to build this? We're just nothing but a bunch of slaves. God said, Moses, you take an offering from among them. An offering from among them. They're nothing but a bunch of slaves. Oh no, they're not. They're the wealthiest nation in the world because they just walked out with the wealth of the nation they built. And yet you say, oh, are you sure? Absolutely, I'm sure. Because it was the greatest offering of the world's history. How do you know it was the greatest? Well, because the Bible said the minister got up after the offering was being given. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't, 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 don't give any more. We got more than enough. When have you ever heard a minister do that? Yet it was the greatest offering of the world because there was a clarity. Hey, we've got to get God here. We've got to get this tabernacle built. And why? Why did they have it? Why did God have a right? Because he had given them everything they had. But what they didn't fully understand was this, that God had to somehow get Egypt out of their thinking because they would always be looking over their shoulder wondering when they're coming after their stuff. I mean, think about it. You just took all their stuff. Eventually, they're coming after it. And where does God take them? God takes them to a cul-de-sac and a trap. God set them up. God put them exactly where they were. We read it in Exodus just a minute ago. Exactly. You go by the sea. You go right there. And I'll tell you what was right there. There were two large mounds on either side. There was an ocean in front of them. Or a sea if you will. And yet there was a great problem behind them. There was the largest most powerful army of the then known world coming after them. And the first thing they began to say is Moses you brought us out here to die that's just dumb right think about it if they they immediately say you should have taken us back there I mean at least we were going to die I mean they were going to die back there but yet they wanted to, you brought us out here to die sounds like to me you were going to die both places but in their mind, they immediately begin to backpedal and wonder, is this, is this what we need? Is this what we're supposed to do? Is this, hey, can I tell you, there's sometimes in our lives where God puts us in the circumstances and it's for our good, it's for our benefit, uh, and it's what God intended for us to be and has called us to be, uh, but looks like at the very onset, uh, why am I here? Uh, it looks like I'm in a trap. Uh, it looks like there's an impossible situation that I'll never overcome. It looks like there's no way out, uh, but you see what God is doing and his intention is to lead you to that place go to that impossible place that place where there's no way you can get out you just pour it all on and see what I will do God said go to that impossible place 
Because sometimes he leads us into that hardship. Because remember, the same God that led you into that is the same God that will lead you out of that. Our whole perception begins to change when we understand, hey, God has allowed me to be in this circumstance today. God knows where I'm at. God understands my situation. I mean, think of the man of Joseph's stature. He just wanted to fulfill his divine dreams. Yet he was seized, stripped, sold as a slave, imprisoned in Egypt. All he wanted to do was show somebody his coat. I mean, look at my new clothes. What are you doing that for? All he wanted to do was tell somebody a dream that maybe he thought was a little wacky too because he'd had pizza the night before. But nevertheless, he just was trying to share the dream. Next thing you know, life's getting rough. He's getting... Slow, sold into slavery. He's in the bottom of a pit and somebody had mercy on him. I don't know how much mercy that was. Die now or get tortured the rest of your life. Yeah, we're going to be merciful. <laughs> Go have a rough life. And yet, Joseph, it seemed like everything that he did, it just consistently got worse. He would rise to the top, and he would be pushed down. He goes to Potiphar's home, and he's risen to the top. He's now in charge. Everything is going great and fine. Just leave me alone. Let me have a good life. I've had a tough life up till now. Everything's fine, but then he's falsely accused. The next thing he knows, it gets worse. He's in jail. Prison. And yet, that's where most of us would have said, forget it. I'm done. I'm just going to eat worms and die. And yet Moses, Joseph said, you know, no, i got to be the best prisoner I, I guess I could ever be. And so he rises to the top of where God intended him to become. And see, God knew exactly where he was. I'm telling you, some days you may be in an impossible situation and circumstance and not understand what really is happening. But you see, you're, you're in good company. Moses, Moses was caught between the splendor of Egyptian royalty and that thankless affliction with God's people. David, David was caught between anointing, being anointed king, but was pursued by the Israelite troops. Hezekiah, he was seeking revival, was trapped by the most powerful army on earth, bent on annihilating God's people. That, that doesn't sound like a great day. That doesn't sound like hope. The disciples sailed at his command. God told them, he said, you go and I want you to sail across there. But unbeknownst to them, they were going to face a terror-filled night on the sea. But God was giving them a purpose and understanding. First Peter 4 12 Behold, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as some strange thing happened to you? You think it's all going to be perfect? Everything's going to be great? Oh, but I'm thankful for the book of John. John 16 33. You will have tribulation. Somebody said, well, thanks for the encouragement. You will have tribulation. But it's kind of like the next door neighbor or the, the family member that's always got to one-up you. You could say, I'm going to the lake house this summer for a week, and they, they're going to Disney World, you know? You could say, well, I'm going to Disney World. Well, they, they're, they're not going to Disney World. They're going to Disney World and a cruise, you know? They're going to see the world on a world trip, you know. And you thought you were doing pretty good, you know. Going to Disney World. But yet, always trying to up one. But, oh, I'm thankful for John here. It's just a clearly up one because you know, you're, you're going to have tribulation. But, but God said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. While you're at your little lake house, I'm world trip tour. I, I made it all. 
I, I put it all together. I know exactly who you are and where you are. Be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Oh, I know there's somebody here tonight. You're going through something you don't understand. But you're trying to figure out your way out of it. But just when you get a revelation that God has put you where you are or allowed you to get in that predicament. For you see to a child of God there is no such thing as accidents. We travel an appointed way. You're there for God's appointment. You are there in his keeping. You are under his training. You are there for a time and a season. But yet the psalmist got a revelation when he said, The steps of a good man are order to the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Somebody said, what if it was my fault? What if I missed it? What if I put myself because of sin in this circumstance? I believe with all of my heart that sincere repentance can route a person back into the will of God. I believe, yes, there'll be certain consequences that you'll deal with residually because of that. But I believe even in time, God can work everything for for our good and for them that are called according to his purpose. I'm telling somebody here tonight, you may be in a situation you don't understand. You may be facing obstacles you cannot comprehend. But can I give you a revelation? God knows exactly where you're at. God has not forsaken you. He just might be setting you up for the greatest victory of your life. Because Joseph... Looks like it should have all been bad. I mean, he got sent to Potiphar's house, but what Joseph didn't understand, and I believe that God, you know, there's a reason why Joseph needed to go to Potiphar's house. Why would he need to be in Potiphar's house and control his finances? Why? Because some guy, someday God was going to call upon him to lead a nation. He needed an MBA, but he didn't have a college to go to. So God said, I'm going to give you the masters in business and administration through hands-on experience. I'm going to train you in Potiphar's house. I'm going to give you every little bit of knowledge you need for that circumstance. And then whenever you got that just right, he's thinking that's the top of his game and that's the best he's ever going to be. That's about the time God said, well, okay, that's enough. Now, test two. Let's go to jail. But you know what? I believe the whole time he's there in jail, the Bible said he became the leader of those. And he led the jail. In fact, he was the guy that was leading the prisoners. But, but will you say, well, what would that do? Well, there was going to come a day when he was going to be leading the nation of Egypt. And as a result of that, he was second in command to Pharaoh. He was going to have to have some leadership ability. I don't know anywhere else you could get better leadership training than to be leading a bunch of prisoners. And yet... In the midst of it all, we see these children of Israel walk in. It's a trap. It's a setup. We're going to die. And yet what they didn't know was God was trying to take out of them this feeling that we're nothing but a bunch of slaves. God said and later in that book of Exodus, God said, I'm going to do this to prove to you who I am and I'm going to do this to give a clear warning and give a clear shot to the rest of the people of the world so that they can know whose you are and whose God you serve. I'm going to give them a great revelation. You say, did it really work? I believe it did. The problem was they had a hard time getting it. They didn't understand what God wanted to do or intended to do. They were still wrapped up even as they get to the promised land. They're wrapped up in their little world and grasshopper thinking when a generation later they show up to the steps of Jericho and nevertheless as they begin to talk to a woman by the name of Rahab, the woman said, hey, I know who you guys are. I know exactly who you are. We've been waiting on you to show up because we understand what happened to an army of Egypt, the most powerful army of the then known world. Yes, we know exactly who you are. You see, God may be taking you to that trap, not to destroy you, but to destroy your enemy. That's right. 
He said, I want to take you and get Egypt out of you. I want to take you and get the things out of you. Why? Because I want to show you that I'm capable of giving you victory. I'm capable of bringing you to where you need to be. You see, Joseph kind of figured it out later. Joseph told his brothers, he said, stop beating yourself up. You're frustrated at yourself. He said in Genesis 45, 5, he said, Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither. For, now catch this, God. They thought they sold him into slavery. But Joseph just kind of won up them and said, You... You didn't, you didn't get this. He said, for God did send me before you to preserve life. God put me in that predicament. And Joseph said to them, fear not, for I am in the place of God. I'm right where God wants me to be. He said, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Why? to bring to pass as it is to this day to save much people alive. Oh, when you get a revelation that God may very well be setting you up, taking you to that impossible place to give you an understanding. Just as Paul told the Roman church, he said, and we know. Ah, it's possible. It just might happen every once in a while. Oh, Paul said, and we know. He said, and we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. And God walks into your life and sets you up. Some of you are saying, I don't understand why all this chaos has happened. It may be for God's glory and to get you to where he wants you to be. You see, we don't want, we're just comfortable back in Egypt. But God said, I got a place I want to take you. You haven't quite gotten this yet. But I'm going to take you and put you into a trap. And it's going to seem like it is absolutely impossible. But I'm going to do it to prove to you whose you are. And who I am. Would you stand with me tonight? When God. When God sets us up. When God brings us to that impossible place. Gideon. (laughs) You're not even sure you want to be at the party in the first place. But you go. God called. He's ready to go to battle. Uh, it says, no, it's, it's too many. Too many? I was kind of liking our odds. Yeah, you got too many. All right. How you want me to solve this? Well, anybody wants to go home, just let them go home. Really? Can I go home? <laughs> Don't think for one moment he really didn't. He wanted to go home after he saw the number of people walked out the door. I mean, I'm thinking Gideon probably a, probably a moment or two thought, hey, God, can we renegotiate? Can I have the guys that went home? You keep these guys? No, it doesn't work that way, Gideon. Okay, well, now that you've made the odds a little worse in our favor, let's go to battle. No, there's still too many. Uh, excuse me, God. I'm not a mathematician, but I don't like these odds. Well, see those guys that are getting a drink over there, lapping like a dog, yeah. Yeah, I don't need them. Um, Lord, I'm looking at those that are standing, and I I, I kind of like to have the guys that are kneeling. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot more of them. I started with thousands and now I'm down to just a handful God said you know what Gideon you're not getting this picture 
Because now what I want you to do is, you know, you can tell the guys to put their swords in their sheaths because I, I really what I want them to do in battle is I want them to carry a torch and a pot. Oh, wow. We're going to try to set them on fire, and if that don't work, we're going to beat them in the head with a pot. This is really good odds, God. No, you're not even going to have to touch them. Excuse me? Pot. Little fire. No, because I'm going to show you that it's not about your power and your ability. It's not even about your numbers. I'm just going to give you a revelation of what I can do. You know, it's time we stop thinking so small in our mentality. I thank God. You know, what if Benny DeMerchant 40 plus years ago had gone to Brazil with the same mentality we have in North America? One city, one church, and we're going to reach this country. But tonight, because of one man believing, did you know there are over a thousand churches in Brazil? Do you know that they have over a thousand Bible school graduates currently pastoring churches? And when he went there, none of that was there. Say, well that's Brazil so what does geography mean anything to God because my Bible said he has the whole world in the palm of his hands and if God can do it there what can he do it here you got what a million three in Maine that's 1,300 churches of 100 just to reach 1% of this population. So, oh man, that's, that's big numbers. You don't know what we face. <laughs> Maybe we, what we need is for God to just kind of drop us into that little impossible circumstance. God, just say, all right, I'm going to put you in that impossible place. Why? Because I want you to see me work. I pastored in Orlando and I don't have time to go into it but I went to the city of Orlando Metro there and was elected by a church great group of people there 23 people elected us to pastor that great little church and we had great revival in fact the first three months we lost 20 people can you say that's fun that was chaos all kinds of sin and garbage that God just kind of brought to the surface and it blew up. I'm sitting there going, what happened? And you know, it's, I didn't start from nothing, but it sure is frustrating when you have a building that you got to try to pay for. And then, pastor in a city where, you know, a million people a, a, a week visit Orlando people come visit and they go on vacation and they get this idea they want to live there so they move there and then they move out of there because they get down there and they have no family so they oh this isn't what I want so they move away so in those 12 years I pastored we had we had 276 people we wanted to God move out of our church and out of the city out of the state Brother Haney was in the car with me not long before he passed away. I was griping and complaining a little bit. I just kind of complained. You know, Brother Haney, it kind of stinks. We had a great church of nearly 200 people just, just a short time ago. and About 18 months, I lost 100 people moving away. My Lord, what happened to that? I'm telling him all the reasons why we can't have revival. 
Brother Haney, he looked at me and he said, just in his way, he said, Brother Hobson, he said, let me tell you something. Everybody has problems. Everybody has challenges. Every city has circumstances that you don't understand. But that does not negate what God is able to do. Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So really what we ought to be doing tonight is saying, God, all right, maybe if I'm not there now, go ahead, let's go. Put me in that impossible place. Now you really know I lost it, okay? Why? Because the second I get in that impossible place, you're going to show up. And you're going to not only tell me that it's possible, but you're going to let generations after me know, hey, look what the Lord has done. Look what he did. Look what he accomplished. God set me up, but when he set me up, he gave me the greatest victory of my life. Gideon, there you are. You're going to defeat this whole army, but you're not even going to raise a sword. Just kidding. It's not about you. It's about me. It's about my power. And I'm here today to say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I'm opening these altars up tonight. I'm asking you to come. I hope these altars fill up tonight as every one of us needs to come to this altar and say, God, here I am. Maybe I'm in an impossible situation right now. I don't see the light of day. But God, I'm just simply asking you, Lord, lead me where you go, I'll follow. God, I'm just going to trust you. But maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm just kind of stagnant, going through the motions. God, maybe you need to put me in that impossible place to build my faith, to let me stand strong and secure and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Come on, that's it. Let's draw to Him. Come on, let's cry out to Him right now across this building. Come on, let's reach out right now. The Lord's here. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, let's cry out to Him right now. Come on, He's here. He's going to do it. Let Him do it right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah.